Yeah. So, um, yeah, I'm um, currently based here in Dumped and at the Newton Institute as part of the Simons Fellowship. And I'm going to talk about some work that I've been doing now uh, with John Taylor, and then a lot of stuff that was on my PhD with David and Sam and Leeds. Um, there is a fair amount of crossover between this and what we've just heard from uh, Francesco, so hopefully getting a slightly different viewpoint on some things will still be useful. So, uh, second introduction today to double diffuse convection. Um, which is defined as convection driven by two different density gradients provided by scalars with different rates of diffusion. And the most common example that um, is often thought about is in the oceans where we've got separate temperature and salinity fields, um, which have uh, diffusivities differing by a factor of about 100. Um, and there's two separate configurations that we can have. Uh, the first one is called salt fingering, which we've heard about for the past hour, uh, where we've got hot and salty water over the top of colder, fresher water. But there's also the opposite setup, uh, which we call diffusive convection, which is where cold and fresh water overlies hot, salty water. And we can get a similar uh, basic inst instability forming. Um, I'm going to focus mostly on salt fingering, um, but a lot of the background is relevant to both and I'll touch a bit on uh, the diffusive regime at the end. So staircases, we see this either salt fingering and diffusive convection instability lead to, uh, I've said uniform in inverted commas because it's obviously not uniform, but it's sort of relatively statistically uniform um, background state where we've got similar scales of fingers throughout the column and um, the overall buoyancy gradient is relatively unchanged from what the background would be. And then over time we see this then secondary instability leading to layer formation where we have this nice fingering field which gradually evolves through this kind of gravity wave phase into these uh, very clear layered structures. <clears throat> and then over time, these layers tend to merge. So we set up here on the left hand side, we've got I think four layers, which moves into three, and then gradually into, into one or two by the end. And one of the interesting things that happens while these mergers are taking place is that the density flux through the staircase tends to increase. So um, these lines are plots of the density flux. Uh, I think this is the temperature, this is the salinity. And we see it kind of goes up gradually, but then we've got a bit of a jump at this time, which is where we've merged from three to two. And then another jump at this time where we've merged from two to one layer. <coughs> So all the stuff that we see from layers is very horizontally invariant. We see um, it's a very one-dimensional problem. And this here is uh, observations from, I think, somewhere in the Caribbean, showing very long uh, spatial scales. This is from 6 to 36 kilometers. And we see these well, well defined staircases with steps existing over these incredibly wide regions. So it seems like there's not that much going on in the horizontal, and most of the stuff is going in the vertical. So the question really is can we ignore all the horizontal dynamics and try and make a simple ish, one dimensional model? that's able to still capture all of the basic dynamics from the initial layering instability through its uh, evolution into well-resolved layers and then their subsequent merging uh, going on to late times. Um, this plot here uh, I think is really nice. It just shows the worldwide distribution of layers 
and uh, the blue ones are diffuse convection regions. Uh, we see them kind of clustered around both poles where we've got that cold water overlying warmer water. And then the red ones are uh, uh, the salt fingers. And we've got big regions of the Mediterranean around North Atlantic, around Australia here, with the intensity of the colour um, corresponding to the number of steps in the staircase. <clears throat> so as we've heard already, um, the kind of most accepted current theory for this is Radko's gamma instability, where we model the system very simply with um, temperature and salinity equations in terms of temperature and salinity fluxes. And if we define this gamma as the ratio of the fluxes and the density ratio as the ratio of the density gradients, then you can work out that there's a linear, linear instability if the gamma is a decreasing function of the density ratio. And this seems to work really nicely. If we look at uh, collections of simulations, we can put in parameters and find this decreasing gamma as a function of R. And in those simulations, layers then, then appear. So it seems to explain the instability. But it's got this problem that uh, Francesco mentioned, which is that it's got an ultraviolet catastrophe, the growth rate increases with wave number, which means that it can't predict the scale of layers. Um, this on its own isn't a, a model that can be used to describe the full evolution of layers. It can only be used to predict the <coughs> initial instability. So I think this is the most up-to-date version of a purely gamma-based model, um, which Radko brought out in 2019, which is where if you split everything down into two different scales, so you look at the dynamics on the finger scale and the layering scale separately, then <clears throat> the effect of the, of the finger scale dynamics on the layer scale equations is to add these hyperdiffusion terms. Um, so we get, uh, we get the second order terms from the, the gamma instability and these from the, the finger scale dynamics. And these then act to regularize that ultraviolet catastrophe. Um, so we get negative growth rates uh, as n gets big. So that seems to have solved the problem really well. We can now uh, solve this model and get very nice looking staircase formations which undergo these merger events as we want. But to get these, we have to work out what the Ki coefficients are. And the way to do that is really to do a lot of um, DNS simulations and fit them using that data. So the question that we've been really trying to answer is, is there a way to get a more directly physically derived model without the need for all this um, DNS calibration? <laughs> so now I'm going to take a bit of a step back or potentially to the side and look back at this uh, Phillips model. So if we've got only a single component of density, we can model it with a single, single uh, equation for the buoyancy, which we can uh, use the chain rule on this and get this uh, diffusion type equation. And this gives us a linear anti-diffusive instability if this df by, db, by dbz is less than zero. And on the surface, this looks like a pretty similar condition to the gamma condition. It's the differential, the, the derivative of a flux 
with respect to a gradient instead of a ratio of fluxes with respect to a ratio of gradients. So it seems like potentially these two are linked and um, there might be a way to bring them together into a single model. Um, this, as we've already heard, again suffers the ultraviolet cat catastrophe and it's the form of F, it's the form of the flux function that um, leads to the instability. So there needs to be some kind of external forcing um, for this to work. Then again, as we've seen before a couple of times, we can regularize this instability through the, the classic um, Lie model, Van Frist, Will, and Smith and Young, by adding in this energy equation, which means that the instability condition is changed from this df by dbz to this kind of modified derivative in terms of not only bz but also the effect of the energy. So this allows um, <clears throat> this allows the total derivative of the flux with the gradient to decrease while the partial derivative doesn't, so we don't have that same um, high wave number, in, sorry, uh, ultraviolet catastrophe. And yeah, so the question that um, my PhD was basically trying to answer is, can this Bly regularization be extended to DDC? And can we make a Bly style model for a system with temperature and salt independently of each other? Okay, so this again, uh, Francesco talked about a bit. Um, this is kind of a first attempt to bring the Bly world into salt fingering. Um, we've already seen this plot. This shows the, the salt fingers turning into these clusters, which then stir the system up. And this stirring then can be added in to the, the Bly energy equation, which then can lead to effectively mapping the double diffusive system onto that. Uh, single density component um, model. And again, we get these nice layers forming, um, but we want to try and model the layering with instability that comes from the double diffusive effect directly, rather than having to parameterize through um, this forcing, whether it's forcing from a, a explicit stirring term or whether the forcing comes from parameterizing the motion of the salt finger clusters. So to extend to two density components, we add an extra equation. So I've called the solidity flux C here and the temperature flux F. So this gives us a three equation system for temperature, salinity and energy in the same kind of language as we had for Bly. And then for simplicity, if we write uh, G is the temperature gradient and D is the solidity gradient, and write these kind of extended uh, derivative terms with capital F sub G and so on, then do the stability analysis around uh, a basic state we find that we'll get instability if this matrix M has negative eigenvalues. And the most important bit of this is this condition here. So F sub G, C sub D minus F sub D, C sub G is negative. So <coughs> this is effectively the equivalent of either the Phillips condition or the gamma condition. And if we make appropriate assumptions about the forms of these Fs and Cs, then we can collapse this onto exactly the gamma instability condition. So this 
is able to capture both, both models at the same time, purely through the choice of what we use for F, C, and P. So if we choose P to have some kind of external energy input, some kind of stirring, then we can turn this into a stirred, a forced system. And the form of F and C is less important because they're, um, because the temperature and salinity will act together as a single buoyancy field and be stirred up into layers. But if instead we don't put in that forcing term, then we can choose forms of F and C that will be, um, that will have the gamma instability acting on them. And then we don't need the external forcing and we'll get layers uh, via gamma. So this essentially captures both types of instability at the same time. And by adding the energy equation, um, it's regularized. So we can use it to make a nice um, late time evolution model. So now from here on, um, this is just about salt fingering. Um, so that's hot and salty over cold and fresh. Um, the dynamics are governed by Boussinesque equations. So we've got momentum, temperature, salinity. And these are non-dimensionalized so that this is slightly different from um, the non-dimensionalization in the last talk. So we've got these four um, parameters that control everything, which are the diffusivity ratio. Sorry, this is the wrong way around actually. This should be kappa s over kappa t, so tau is very small, about 0.01. Um, Prandtl number, um, density ratio we've seen before. And then in this non-dimensionalization, the domain height is not one, so that's also important. And then these equations have a, uh, are in the, these are in the presence of background gradients. So we've got a, a background temperature gradient, which is one. Salinity gradient is one over R naught. And in the range of R naught where salt fingering happens, which is R naught is greater than one, then the total buoyancy gradient is one minus one over R naught. So that's still a, a positive gradient. So we've got stabilizing temperature, destabilizing salinity, and overall stable buoyancy gradient. So I'm going to go through the process for getting from these to the model that we've been using, um, just for the temperature equation. Um, there's a few things that I've left out here. Um, if you want to see everything in a bit more detail, then um, you can find me later. But there's a few too many precise details to show here. So if we take the temperature equation, <coughs> And if we decompose into mean and perturbation parts, uh, so we split up the temperature. And if we average this, we get the, an equation for the mean temperature in terms of a fluctuation flux term. Subtract this from the original, and we now get an equation for the fluctuation uh, temperature in terms of the flux of the mean. So then we multiply this by the, sorry, this W prime is the, um, the fluctuation vertical velocity. And then we do this scaling where we assume that there's a length scale, which we'll call L. So we scale the, the Z derivatives with minus one over L squared, and then the time derivative with a time formed from the L and then the kinetic energy, which we define in terms of W. Um, you can put a constant in front of this. So um, E can be any multiple of this and it still works out the same in the end. <clears throat> so we do this scaling and then if we re rearrange three, we get um, this form for the flux, the fluctuation <coughs> flux, which then gets plugged back into two to give our model temperature equation. 
and then we do the same for the salinity, the same for the energy. Um, so if you look at this, this flux term looks like Le to the half, which is kind of a, a turbulent diffusivity form. And if this one didn't exist, it would just be Le to the half times the temperature gradient. But effectively, the diffusion term in the original equation has modified that pure turbulent diffusivity to give this form instead. And if we do that with the salinity and the energy as well, then we get the Prandtl number and the tau, the diffusivity ratio. Um, I've written D as this turbulent diffusivity here, um, sort of for ease of notation. So now we've effectively got these turbulent diffusivities, but in each of these equations, uh, they're modified by the molecular diffusivities. And this um, modification is what makes the temperature and the salinity fluxes different, which is then what allows our gamma instability to come in. So then the last thing to do here is to parameterize this D or equivalently the length scale. <clears throat> and this is a parameterization that's been chosen based on quali qualitative arguments. Um, it makes sense that if the energy is large, then there's going to be more of this um, turbulent diffusion going on. If the energy is small, then there's less mixing, so there should be less. So D is increasing with the energy. <clears throat> Likewise, if, um, if the gradient is very small, like in a layer, sorry, like in a, if the gradient is large, like in a uh, interface between two layers, we expect there'll be less, um, <coughs> and R being large corresponds to the gradient being small, so D is decreasing with R. And then this delta R squared is added in just to stop um, e equals not being the solution because we want to make sure that this system only really comes up with positive energy states. <clears throat> so if we take that system, um, it emits background states where this is the perturbation temperature and salinity. So the background state still has a uh, temperature gradient one, salinity gradient one over R0. Um, the energy depends on the R0 based on the steady state energy equation. And it looks a bit like this. <laughs> so you can imagine this uh, background state back in a full simulation looking like this. So it's kind of statistically uniform, but it's not really uniform. And then if we look at this, the instability conditions uh, around this background state, um, we get this, this black curve here is the one that's important. And it's, it's very sharp, so it actually goes down to about here and then back up. But the key point is that we've got this region where FGCD minus FDCG is negative. So this, in this region, we expect there to be a layering instability. And then if we pick a value of R0 here, and look for the growth rate, we find this uh, growth rate curve um, where we've got an increase and then a decrease. So we've got this well-defined most unstable mode, which is going to then predict the initial spatial scale that the layers form on. <clears throat> so then if we uh, solve the equations, time step them forward, um, we see these nice layers form. We start with a, a uniform buoyancy gradient, which gradually grows into fairly well-defined layers by here. This is the buoyancy gradient, which is a bit easier to see some of the dynamics on. Um, we see 
a large stack of layers which then gradually merge and their number reduces over time until we've only got one left over here at the end. This isn't in the center, I think purely because the number of initial layers isn't a multiple of two. So at some point there's been some, uh, some non-symmetric merging going on. <clears throat> um, these mergers uh, follow a form called B mergers, where strong interfaces grow at the expense of weak ones. So for example, if we look at these bottom two interfaces here, this one's a lot weaker than this one, and then this one dies out, and this one continues to exist. And during that merger process, um, the gradient in those interfaces increases because the total gradient, the total buoyancy jump between the top and the bottom of the fluid has to stay constant. So if, so basically this buoyancy jump from this interface has to be given to this interface. So it's gradient uh, has to go up. <clears throat> and then at the same time, during these mergers, we see this increase in flux. So this is the same, uh, same panel as on the last slide. And then this dotted line shows the buoyancy flux over time. And at each of these red lines, where we see one of these key merger events taking place, there's a sharp increase in the flux. And we can explain this by appealing to another bit of great work by Radko, who came up with this, uh, what he calls the merger theorem, which says that uh, neighboring interfaces will be unstable to this merger event if the uh, the flux difference across an interface is a decreasing function of the buoyancy jump across an interface. And if you think about what this means backwards, that means that if the buoyancy jump across an interface goes to zero as in a merger, then that means that the flux has to increase across that, which really explains how this flux uh, gradually moves up. So what this really tells us is then, if we look at rail staircases, which have very large fluxes, potentially this means that the reason those fluxes are large is because mergers have already taken place in the past. So, um, so that's why we can see quite large differences between fluxes in say regions of ocean with staircases versus without. So that's all very nice, but there's quite a lot of room for improvement. So the first, I think, major issue with what we've seen is we know that staircases form for R naught greater, like R naught just above one should form staircases. But this instability plot has R min being about 1.4. So something has gone wrong in the parameterizations and so far, we've not done any um, direct comparison of the results of the model with simulations. So that's also something that uh, I'm wanting to look at. And then lastly, I've said this only works for salt fingering. So what about diffuse convection? So now from here on, this is all fairly new, fairly um, speculative. Um, but hopefully still interesting. So I've run a load of simulations for a range of different parameters and from those calculated the temperature and salinity flux and used that to then calculate the turbulent diffusivity separately for temperature and salinity and it turns out that actually um, so these blue are the temperature and red are the salinity and it's actually d squared they follow the same pattern, but they're actually quite different to each other. So it turns out that dt is not equal to ds, and the temperature and salinity fields, the pure turbulent part of that motion is different for each of those. And if we try and fit these curves, try and fit these points with a curve, this is a fairly reasonable option. I'm not dead set on that yet, 
Um, so that's something that uh, is very subject to revision. But if we take this and um, do our new stability based on that instead, then it looks pretty promising. Um, this plot is from the simulations. So this is each point of R is actually a different value of gamma. Sorry, is a, is a different simulation. So again, back to what Francesco said, this isn't um, gamma and R from a single simulation run. But we see this uh, minimum value here, which matches the upper boundary of the unstable region for a particular value of alpha and beta. And the minimum value um, for instability goes all the way down to one. So this seems to be working quite nicely. Um, I've not yet got a chance to look at this. It does the most unstable mode match the, sim the simulations. Um, but it seems like by um, spending a bit of time looking at the forms of these alpha and beta coefficients. Um, we should be able to make some good progress there. And then lastly, um, what about diffusive convection? So in the current form with D being equal, for the range of R0 where diffusive convection happens, this steady state equation has no solutions, which means that that just doesn't admit solutions where we have that semi sort of uniform diffusive convection field, like we saw for the salt fingering, which means that this is useless as a model. We can't, we can't make any predictions based on it. But if dt is not equal to ds, then we do get solutions. So this is the um, the diffusive convection steady state energy as a function of R0. And this looks pretty hopeful. That's as far as I've got. Um, I'm hopefully looking forward to getting some good feedback from everyone over the next few weeks here. So to sum up, um, staircases are a, a very wide uh, phenomenon. They seem to be mostly mostly just vertical dynamics, so we should be able to model them in one day. Um, previously, we've seen gamma and Phillips instability um, are both good ways of describing layered systems, but both of them on their own without any alterations lead to high wave number instabilities. Um, I've shown you a new horizontally average derived from the original Buzanesque equations, the lifestyle model, which for salt fingering gives us well-resolved staircases and it captures quite a nice range of the dynamics all the way from the inception of layers to late times when we've only got one layer left. And I've shown and explained why we see this increase in the buoyancy flux uh, due to the mergers. And then right now I'm trying to make the model better by changing the parameterizations in it. And hopefully this is going to allow it to also explain everything in diffusive convection. Thank you very much, Paul. Are there questions in the room? I will start with a naive question. Uh, so you are talking about the parameterization that you want to fine tune using the simulation. Mm -hmm. And, and you, you are talking about D, and I was wondering, can you work on L, the length that you use to rescale um, the coordinates in your horizontal your rich model? And I guess one of the questions was, um, is this natural length that should arise uh, comparable to the, the size of the blocks that yeah. um, I'm just yeah. commenting about? So D, parameterizing D or parameterizing L is really equivalent. Um, the, the Bly model, where there was definitely a set stirring length, works well with L. Here, there's kind of less of an obvious way of defining a length scale, um, which is why I've kind of chosen to move over to D. Um, when, when this was published here, um, we used L. 
um, but uh, parameterizing either kind of works. Um, I've not looked at how that length scale would compare exactly to the blobs. Again, because I've not actually done that much direct comparison to simulations, but that's definitely something that would be interesting to look at. I, I, I was just wondering, because actually a question I would have liked to ask uh, Francesco was how you go from finger to blob, and if there is a model to explain what's the saturation length at which yeah. So, so I, 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 I think I can't answer that. I think that he's got a, basically in his model for the length scale, he's defined a, a blob length and a finger length, and then defined, I think, an exponential transition between them. Okay. So just a technical question. In your horizontally averaged model, yes. uh, if I forget what, yeah. What's, what's the justification for the sigma in the uh, turbulence energy diffusivity? In um, the first term in the E sub T equation, but the D that's, D, that's kind of like the, a, a, di, a turbulent diffusion of turbulent energy, yeah, right? Yeah, so, so how, well, how does the sigma find its way in So there? that comes in exactly the same way as the one under the tau. So if you if you take the if you take the momentum equation, we've got the diffusion diffusion term, momentum ah, diffusion. Ah, ah, and then so if we do the stand, that's just sorry. the residue of the fact that there's a finite collisional diffusion. Yeah. So no. I didn't I didn't show, but we do yeah. the standard energy equation uh, derivation. The diffusion but term that must be comes pathetically into pathetically small compared to the turbulent diffusivity. Um, yeah, but in terms of just kind of, I've kept it there in terms of symmetry with these things. But I mean, I, yeah, okay. I mean, I've been, we've encountered this kind of question in other problems, and it seems just, you know, pathetically small. I mean, in some cases, as opposed to say heat diffusion or something that yeah. can be much larger. So, but yeah. Anyway, so it, okay. that it's potentially not making much of a difference, but kind of for for prettiness of all the terms looking the same. Sure. And there was a question from Guillaume. In uh, in real life, you might also be in the situation where you you don't have your gradient, which is constrained, but you you force your fluxes. Yeah. So uh, that might change your uh, your merger rule or the merger theorem. Uh, do you have any speculation as to you know how much what you show uh, would you know change? Should you force each flux rather than you know having at every time set this conservation? Yeah. Gradient? So I think the I don't have much on it but, uh, here. But I think this. Um, kind of merger theorem rule is fair and generic. There's actually another type of mergers as well called H mergers, which is, this might be the wrong way around, but I think it's if the flux decreases as a function of the height of the step, then we get a different type of merger, which looks like, it's kind of hard to show, but it looks like these ones. So in the, the Bly system, um, instead of weak interfaces dying and strong interfaces getting bigger, we get, for example here, two neighboring interfaces joined together and then create a wider interface. So um, changing the setup, whether it's kind of flux driven or gradient driven, might affect the kind of the differing growth rates of those two types of mergers. But I can't say exactly how. Are there other questions? Okay, so if not, let's, uh, let us thank again Paul.